name is Luke Cavan. I work at uh, Continuum Analytics in Austin. Um, I'm a, a Bokeh core developer. So I'm here to talk about um, making interactive visualizations uh, on the web using Bokeh. Um, so there's actually sort of a lot to Bokeh, much more than I can fit into 20 minutes. So I'm really going to chunk it down just into talking about the interactive bits um, and playing with that and those, and then like the implications and like doing streaming charts, and then some advice on publishing those in a variety of mediums um, on the web. Uh, so this is a, a screen cap from our gallery page. Um, Many to express the huge variety of visualizations you can make uh, using Bokeh. There's sort of three levels of the, the plotting API. There's a high level charts interface in which you can make very sort of canned, like bar charts, time series, like one liners. Um, and then in levels below that, there's um, a, a plotting, what we call model interface. We can do some really unique stuff based on low-level uh, canvas primitives that we call glyphs. So it's your, it's your recs and your, your rays. Um, so you can really do uh, very expressive visualizations in like the sort of D3 style. So uh, when evaluating a new library, like the, the first question I ask is like, you know, why should I use it? Like, was it was it offered for me? Um, Bokeh at its core is is really a, a, a web first plotting library. Um, so it outputs uh, HTML canvas elements. Um, so you actually open and interact with them in your browser, as opposed to uh, Matplot has several sort of backends, uh, PNG and SVG and all these. Um, we feel like we really um, do well in terms of novel graphics, like I said. Uh, interactive visualizations, um, the fact that we're sort of based in the browser, you can take advantage of a lot of the sort of like JavaScript niceties, uh, especially in terms of uh, like scroll events and click events and these sort of jQuery-esque interactions. Um, if you have small and medium-sized data, I think I'm off by an order of magnitude. Uh, generally, you have to keep yourself below 100,000 points. Um, but OK, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a sec. All of the sort of data to make the plot is actually embedded in your HTML document. Um, so really, this limit is actually a sort of browser limit to where if you're trying to plot you know, 10 million points, you'll actually cause your browser RAM. RAM It'll slow down, and usually you'll run into those problems where, like, not that it won't render the plot, but if you're trying to do interactions really quickly, like you're trying to like scroll real quickly or zoom real quickly, where you're causing this re-render loop to run over and over, you'll see a lot of stuttering. Um, another benefit too is then you get this sort of uh, nice web interaction with no or like minimal JavaScript. Uh, I think early in the history of Bokeh, like the, there, were, there was a hard line saying like no JavaScript, no JavaScript ever, and they've sort of softened on that to sort of capture some unique abilities. And their even work is you sort of see these um, like modal use cases where a lot of people are doing the same things and we'll like encapsulate those in Python. Um, and it's becoming a stable popular library. We, uh, we got over 3,000 like stars on our GitHub page. We're nearing in on 10,000 commits. I think there's someone's promised a beer when they're that person. Um, we have like over 125 contributors, so it really is like starting to get pretty big and pretty out there. Um, so in a 20 minute talk, I hate to talk about architecture, but it's sort of, if you can wrap your mind around, helps at least me um, understand what's going on. Um, the real sort of magic of, of Bokeh is this Bokeh JS layer. Um, but starting at the top, I guess, uh, Bokeh it makes what we call plot objects that when you call like a, a wrapper method on, it serializes and returns just a JSON, like a, a declarative JSON spec um, that's consumed by Bokeh.js. And actually, that's what renders your, your canvas um, and HTML elements. 
because we have this JSON scene graph intermediate that we call it, um, Bokeh JS at least isn't sort of Python specific, so there's actually a lot of different language bindings for Bokeh JS. Um, there's Bokeh Scala made by a, a colleague named um, Almar Klein. There's uh, R Bokeh. There's actually a Julia Bokeh, which um, one of my colleagues is a uh, Jim Christ is a Julia developer and says it's actually like the most common Julia plotting library is Julia Bokeh. Uh, and there's a few others, the Lua binding. Um, and so we, we really appreciate that flexibility. And then you'll see later, uh, like most of the interactivity comes from mutating this JSON scene graph. So when you sort of want your interactivity, it's like if you use like a box zoom and you zoom over an area of the plot, what's actually happening is in this JSON scene graph, you're just changing the range that's shown in the plot and then triggering Bokeh.js to reconsume and re-render the plot. Um, so let's talk about tools and widgets. Um, and so tools are interactions on the canvas element and we'll show these uh, real quick. Uh, so this is just a, a gallery example of ours. Um, and it sort of shows two things, I guess. First is like, this is a, a, a sort of live plot and all of the examples in the gallery and like the documents that we have are all live plots um, because the plots are just sort of HTML canvas elements. So like we have a, a pan tool so you can click and drag it around. There's a zoom tool so you can like zoom in on specific regions. Um, you can zoom on axes, and there's, this one has, and so those all come standard, and there's a couple extra ones that you can specify, or you can, so you can specify which tools you want to plot. This also has a, a hover tool added um, that, that corresponds to some data in that, that JSON scene graph. Um, and a lot of the tool interactions are highly customizable, so like, here, the, the tool tip given by the, the hover tool, uh, here is just a, a, a hash table of what we want to call um, the key and then the corresponding value. You're also able to just add like custom HTML if you want to show pictures. There's also like a tap tool, so if you want to tap, you can like open links. Um, so that's all very nice. Uh, and then next was widgets. Um, and so this is a bit more of a, an in-depth um, example made by a colleague named Sarah Bird. And she made a, a Hand Rosling's uh, a visualization from a, a TED talk they did, I think 10 years ago now. Um, and I think in the TED talk, he was, he was hoping to like uh, dispel the myth that there's a first and third world as this sort of like distribution. But the, the point is, uh, well, two things. First, this is just a, a static HTML page, so there's no sort of server serving this image, and the data for the image is actually stored in the HTML document, so I can email it to someone else, or I can open it offline. And as you see, as you drag the slider along, it actually mutates the, the data that gets graphed in that data spec and then calls a re-render. Uh, so you can make these sort of very nice uh, visualizations. Uh, I will warn you that these like bokeh plots, I guess, won't get rendered, however, on sort of static hosted like a MB Viewer or GitHub now renders IPython notebooks because they won't um, execute arbitrary JS as a security measure. Uh, so you won't see a plot. Um, if you use something like a binder or um, Anaconda has a new hosted uh, 
sort of notebook server, then, then it will work fine. Um, so the, the next thing was to sort of dive into why this example works. Um, so where this example used zero JS, this one sadly I think has five lines. Um, so we're actually going to look at what those are. Um, so the Gapminder example actually uses what we call a, a custom JS uh, callback. So a lot of the tools and widgets have a, a callback attribute. Um, and to that, we're, we're currently encapsulating what we see as sort of um, normal user use cases. So we see a lot of people like want to be able to you know click a state on a map and have it like pop up a link. So that's why we've encapsulated very well. Um, but for stuff that like people need a little bit more flexibility, we have this like custom JS callback. Um, so here you see all Sarah really did is she is getting the slider value and then setting the, the data source as the x, y for where that, that ball is for that year, and then changing the year on the, the transparent back, and then just triggering a re-render. Um, and so that's great. And so that's, that's what I found personally is that you usually, if you're willing to write like 10 lines of really ugly JavaScript, uh, which is my sort of MO, you can get some really sort of neat uh, dynamic interactions. Um, so next is the, uh, okay, column data source stuff. Uh, so this is just to hold in your mind real quick. Um, so if you're making a plot, like a, if you're making a bar chart, say you can pass like an, an X array and a Y array, and when your model gets sort of serialized this JSON thing, the data gets stored in a model called like column data source, and uh, that's how Bokeh.js sort of maps like what column needs to be graphed in what way. Um, similarly, you can sort of specify as column data source on the, the Bokeh side uh, and sent like a, the, the, as a, a key value pair, I guess, and specify that the key is a string and then pass in this source and it'll work. Uh, so now we're going to a flashy example. Um, so in terms of, uh, so this is an example that was made for SciPy by my boss, Brian Vanderven, and it's actually using uh, my laptop microphone to, to capture sound and run an FFT and, and do some analysis. So this is just a, it's a single page Flask app that uses some coffee script on the front end to actually like manage like the pause and, and run button and then trigger the re-rendering. And so all the coffee script we're really doing is um, pulling every couple of milliseconds the, the input to the speaker mutating this data source in the, in the sort of JSON scene graph and triggering re-render. Um, and so the two sort of takeaways from this is like, one, this is actually fairly highly responsive in terms of there's very little sort of stuttering. So you can actually do what I again called like medium performance um, visualization. Like if you're doing like really extreme sort of image uh, like tile, like you want like a tile manager, we're like, we're not quite there yet, but this is pretty good. And second, um, we think it's uh, like, or we really try hard to have like our, our projects be very customizable. Uh, so in terms of uh, like how this plot is actually just embedded in, in the document without sort of any ranges, um, is actually relatively easy. Uh, we add a new sort of support for remote data sources. So instead of um, having a model in your scene graph called data source, we now actually have support for like um, 
embed in a script that makes Ajax calls. So, hoping this doesn't work because it, or does work because it crashed my browser. Um, ah, it is working. So, we're so just, the, the Flask app is just serving data at this localhost 5000 slash data. Uh, so we have this new Ajax data source where you can point it at the URL and set a polling frequency. Um, and then when you do show, it gets serialized in QMM and in the notebook. But this is actually streaming data off my microphone and making a real-time chart in seven lines, which I think is fairly impressive. So if I snap real loud, the, the X, Y axis, like I'm not running any FFT, so it's sort of a, it's a meaningless chart other than the fact that it streams pretty well. Um, uh, so my last thing, let me stop that, uh, is actually talking about um, embedding plots that you make. Uh, so we, we, we sort of play long, like get along well with like the, the IPython notebook um, in like a IO module. You just import and call a, an output notebook uh, method and you will, um, like I'm doing here, and you can embed plots very nicely. Um, in the notebook, there is how the Gapminder um, example runs. There's a, a, a similar output file callable, and it will just create like a static HTML file. Um, if you want to do something a bit more like the spectrogram example, there's a, a bokeh embedding module where you can actually take your um, plot and uh, pass it to this components callable, and I'll return a, a script and div that you can embed in a template, uh, sort of using the, the Jinja style. Similarly, there's a, a file HTML uh, callable. I forget now. But that's how, um, uh, that's actually, I guess, what the, uh, the Gapminder example is doing, because she sort of had a, a ginger template that had the video and some other nice uh, styling. And then I think there's finally there's a, an auto load static where it actually will just uh, save a JS file uh, to a location that you specify and then you just call that script, you pass it a, the JS to your, uh, the script name to your template and when the template loads, it'll run the script and load your, your plot in that way. So you do have a lot of um, options in terms of embedding. Uh, wow, I have two minutes left. Uh, questions? Yes? Yes, yeah, so we do um, support GeoJSON as a, a format, but yeah, it's, um, it's plot out as a, what we call patches, which I think is actually what it might be called in D3. Um, but yeah, it's not real bad. Um, and then uh, there, Bokeh.js is smart enough to like be able to calculate the centroid of patches to do sort of hover tool so it can like hit strike and stuff. So you can also like this doesn't have that tool selected, but like you can do like selection and stuff, and it'll select sort of whole patches if you drag across the corner. Uh, any other questions? Well, great. Thank you so much.